Albany, New York, the great capital of the Empire State with a population of nearly 100,000. Sitting on the Hudson River, it is home to the Empire State Plaza, Washington Park, and many other architectural and historical landmarks. While downtown Albany may be best known for state politics, the city has always hosted many spaces for live music, from small, dusty dive bars to the gorgeous Palace Theater and everything in between. Live music has been happening in Albany, New York for a long time, but from the early 90s until now, there is one man who has left quite the mark on the scene. Originally from the west end of Long Island, Greg Bell came to the area as a deadhead college student, became a special education teacher, and for over 30 years has been one of the strongest staples of the city's live music community. Well, probably the first live music I saw were probably junior high dances. I remember the first junior high dance I went to, uh, there was a band, it was like the first young hippies in town. And I can remember specifically them playing uh, some Bob Dylan. I think it was 1968, I saw Tommy James and the Shondells. So that was the first real rock concert I went to. My first experience with the Grateful Dead, I remember early on in the Grateful Dead history, they were in like teen magazines, it'd be like, you know, you know, pig pen looking like contest and, you know, get a date with Bob Weir. It was like just stupid teenage stuff that they were doing with all the bands. And then like 1970, I was a senior in high school. Working Man's Dead came out right in the, like, the fall of 1970. And I can remember hearing Uncle John's band and thinking, oh, that's really cool. And, you know, Casey Jones. And so that year, uh, Stony Brook University was doing a ton of shows. The night before Halloween, a bunch of us were, got tickets to go see this band, The Grateful Dead, and the new riders of the Purple Sage at Stony Brook Gym. So we went to the show, and uh, I think we were 17, and my one friend had a license, you know, a night license, so we were able to go in his van, and you know, we were smoking Mexican weed and drinking Peel's Big Mouth beers and snorting uh, cold capsules that we like, accumulated at military school that he would give you out if you went to the infirmary. I went and it was a seven o'clock show and a midnight show. And I knew people at Stony Brook, so we were able to get like the really cheap tickets. I think we got our tickets for $2. And uh, at Stony Brook, all the shows were seven o'clock shows and midnight shows. And if you went and bought a ticket for the seven o'clock show and you just didn't leave, you could stay for the midnight show. So basically we just stayed there. They played until about four in the morning. So my first dead show was actually two shows and it was an amazing experience. And when I went to college the following year, I ended up living on what was the basketball wing at Siena College. But it turned out that a lot of the basketball players, even though they had short hair and could play basketball, were all secret deadheads. There was just something about the whole atmosphere, the whole community atmosphere that was there. Everybody was friends. I mean, you could sort of tell who was a deadhead and who wasn't, so you'd be out someplace. If you were a fan of the Grateful Dead, you automatically had friends no matter where you went. It opened me up to a lot of new things musically that I probably hadn't listened to before. I mean, they were the true American band. While Greg started to develop his love for the Grateful Dead and other rock and roll acts, he made the move up to Albany to attend Siena College, start his teaching career, and eventually meet the love of his life, Marilyn. When I moved to Albany, there was a lot of other people from Ticonderoga who had moved down here also, so I got to, you know, have somebody to go out with, and um, a really good friend of mine, Doug Dickinson, was a big music lover too, and he would we would go out to all these clubs everywhere, you know, he would find, let's go see, uh, I think Blotto's playing tonight. That's how I met a lot of people that I know, still know now, and that's how eventually I met Greg. I actually had made friends with a couple people down here that he was friends with. I guess the story is he had noticed me before I noticed him, and so he was trying to get them to arrange, like, to have me meet them out so he could accidentally show up there. <laughs> accidentally show up there. And they never did because they weren't sure about if I would want that, you know. <laughs> but just coincidentally, I did show up and so did he. And uh, so at first I didn't, I didn't really know him much. I, I said, hi, yeah, how you doing, good, you know. But, uh, he was persistent, and we met again at another party of our same mutual friends, Christmas party. I remember at the end of the party, he asked me for my number, and I still wasn't sure, because I didn't really know him very well. And he goes, well, if you're not doing anything New Year's Eve, 
Uh, there's going to be an all-night party at Thirsty's. You know, a month later it's New Year's Eve, and I'm out with my two other sets of married friends. They all go home. It's not even quite midnight yet, and I'm going, mm, I should probably just go home, but yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> so I went a few places, and I didn't really find anybody I knew. And I said, well, there's that place that guy talked about is Thirsty's. And sure enough, I got there at like 2 or 3 in the morning, and I suddenly hear it. I feel a tap on my shoulder, and it's Greg. And he goes, hey, you showed up. He said, yeah. And then, I don't know, we just hung around and partied till we left, I believe, at 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I think we were the last ones. They were putting stools on the bar. And we went and took a nap. And I remember him saying, I'm going to marry you someday, as he was, like, falling asleep. And I, and I remember in my head going, yeah. <laughs> It was weird. I think it was just meant to be. Well, I mean, Marilyn, I met, I met Marilyn at shows. So, I mean, she's a huge music lover. I mean, I never, I could not have gotten through all this without Marilyn's support, you know? She's been very supportive of me. And now, you know, she's more popular than I am. She's like probably the best known woman in Albany, you know, the queen of rock and roll, you know? After years of spending time as a live music fan, Greg decided to promote his first concert under the name of Two Fools Presents with his friend Dale Metzger. They knew the bands, had plenty of friends who liked to have a good time. Why not give it a try? You know, one night a friend of mine and I were sitting around in a bar talking about, oh, you know, we know all these bands, you know, we should have a party and get some bands playing. And you know, we're like, well, where can we could do this? And a guy who I worked with at, at the school that I taught at, was uh, this guy Ernie Michaels, and he was the head of the Masons Hall on Lower Madison Avenue. He says, hey, you can rent out our room. We'll let you use our liquor license to sell beer, and you know you can use that room. So we did a show with uh, Mother Judge, Hard Times, The Sharks, and Brian Kenny and Friends. It was $10 all the beer you could drink, and it sold out. <laughs> they, call, they call themselves Two Fools Productions. Um, and uh, yeah, we were the first ones. Uh, uh, he, he, it was us, uh, Mother Judge, the McCrells, and uh, Brian Kenny. He wanted to put on a little show with all his friends, just as a fun thing to do. <laughs> it was crazy. So yeah, we did another one. Yeah, did pretty well on that one. Then we did uh, our first outdoor festival, which is called the Summer Fool Fest, because our company at that time was called Two Fools Present. And it was me and Dale Metzger. So we did our first outdoor festival up at uh, in Rensselaerville at the Shell Inn, and that did not do as well. You know, we were sort of uh, delusional about how many people would actually drive up to uh, around Thatcher Park to go see a bunch of local bands, and it wasn't a lot, but it was a fun time. Like I always tell everybody who ever wants to be a concert but a concert promoter, I always say to them, I say, listen, I say, here's the best test you can ever have. I said, get yourself about three hundred dollars, put it in your hand and set it on fire, and then drop it to the ground. If it bothers you watching that money burn up, you're never gonna make it in the concert business. If it doesn't bother you, you might have a shot at it. And God bless Greg. I'm sure Greg's seen a lot of times where his money got set on fire and it didn't bother him. You know, anyone that works in the business will tell you being a promoter is really hard. And yeah, there are a lot of nights where you do go home with empty pockets or maybe you even lost money. Eventually, Greg would join together with co-worker and friend Jeff Guthrie to form Guthrie Bell Productions. Guthrie at the time was already booking shows in New York's capital and stumbled upon Valentine's, a bar on New Scotland Avenue interested in hosting live music. Jeff Guthrie, who was a friend of mine and he was managing the Sharks at the time, he says, I, says, oh, you know, I, says I, found, I found this room where we can do shows and you want to go look at it. And it turned out it was upstairs at Valentine's and no one was really doing shows there. I think as I went around trying to book bands, like one day I walked into Valentine's and um, to see if I could put somebody downstairs. I was probably booking a solo act. And I met the owner, it was Karen. And um, she said to me, you know, geez, I'd really like to get upstairs going. And she goes, well, why don't you come and take a look, you know, and see what it looks like. And uh, this is the peak before, it kind of was like a banquet hall was not suited for music, it was not, not good at all, but, and I think that would have been a big thing for me to do at that time. I mean, Greg was working in his teaching job, I was working in mine, and I just didn't think that I could do it by myself, so I asked Greg to see if, you know, come check this place out, you know, I think it's got potential. Jeff and I decided we are going to start doing shows stupidly on Sunday after, late Sunday 
afternoon, early Sunday evening, because no one wants the weekend to end. So we figured, oh, people will come out, check out the music, you know? So we did a couple shows, lost some money. Did a couple more shows, lost some more money. So we just sort of, we basically kept doing shows, trying to make back the money we were losing. But we kind of just kept plugging away, and, and kind of, Karen did help us kind of develop the room. I mean, when we started, there was, there was no stage, there was no uh, sound equipment. There's no soundboard, so it was really hard. It was kind of hard to do. I would say early shows would go on kind of the disaster mode. Um, they were, they were not good. So I mean, you know, we're doing a lot of shows, but we weren't really making any money. It was like a hobby at the time. You know, Jeff was a full-time teacher. I was a full-time teacher. This was just something we were doing for fun. When I started doing shows, my wife Marilyn was pregnant. And I was trying to figure out some way to be able to get out of the house. I said, okay, here it is. I got a job, honey. I got to go to work. I'm sorry, you have to watch the baby, but I got to go to work, yeah. It was fine with me, really. I mean, there were a couple times I remember sitting on the couch with Patrick as a baby in my arms going, bye, have a good night. <laughs> yeah, but, but generally, it was all good. But as the years went on, you know, Karen put some, um, some money into it, and we were able to get more than just local acts to come in, and we were able to kind of hit some people up that were that were good and we're kind of maybe passing through. And I think that was the whole thing of trying to find people that are passing through midweek going from Boston to New York. The key to Valentine's was this lady named Karen Valentine and she owned Valentine's and she wanted to make money. Like she didn't care much. She didn't, she liked, she knew, understood selling liquor. She got that part. She, she didn't understand music. Um, she she knew that, and she knew she needed a partner um, to promote the music if it was actually going to work. And that's where Greg came in, and uh, he started downstairs with the smaller stage. It's a bar that held maybe 150 or 200 people. Um, and then there was a room upstairs, up like freaking like 60 steps. I mean, the load in sucked. You had to go right up these steps. Um, and then there was a room that could hold probably 400 people. You know, just the whole vibe that Valentine's created, definitely a huge part of me growing up in the area and wanting to be a part of live music was just the vibrancy of how much stuff was going on in that one dirty little, you know, dive bar of a venue. It was amazing. Yeah, great music was made at Valentine's, but the venue itself was logistically a little weird and the bathroom tended to flood. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those places where you, you kind of hated it, but you loved it too. There was a uh, kind of big backstage area and that would always just be full of people partying. And of course, Greg would be right in the mix. So that, that's how like Greg became one of, one of the guys, you know, uh, through those early days. Uh, never met a weed circle that he didn't like, that's for sure. Valentine's was a dump. I mean, there's no other way of describing it. I mean, it had no atmosphere. I mean, it was dingy, it had cement walls, the sound was not great, you know. You know, we changed, you know, we, we brought in sound panels. We ended up building a different stage and moving it to a different corner. But it was, it was a dump. I mean, you didn't, you know, you could still smoke back then. You know, your people would put cigarettes out on the floor. I mean, <clears throat> it was not a place anybody was really worried about dropping their beer in or, you know, it was a dump. But it was huge because we had so many shows there with, you know, local bands. I mean, my focus was always at that point local bands. The national acts started coming through as sort of an afterthought. I mean, my goal was to make young Albany bands known and get them out in front of an audience and pay them a decent amount of money and treat them with respect. People would stay downstairs, it was free, it was free downstairs, and you, could, you, you couldn't even beg them to come upstairs because they, they didn't want to pay to see anybody. You know, they didn't want to pay a $5 cover to see bands they didn't know. So I just remember you know, we were doing shows and we weren't really doing that well with getting people out. And one night it was like Moonboot was playing, the downstairs was full, and I knew I was going to lose money. I said, fuck it. I went downstairs, I said, it's free to come upstairs tonight. So all the people came upstairs, and from then on, the Moonboot Lover was huge. It was like the biggest band coming through Albany. And then, yeah, we started working with like the C Pods, and we were working with. Uh, you know, when Mo first started out, and Conan Buddha, and Perfect Thyroid, and Yoke, and Schleo. So we were doing a lot of touring bands. I got known as the jam band guy, even though I was doing 
a ton of indie rock and I was doing metal and I was doing hardcore and I was doing rap. I got known as, I was pigeonholed as the jam band guy. I think the jam community in Albany and in general has, uh, I mean, it's either the only genre I can think of that I throw the word community in with. Everyone's more connected with each other than other scenes and other types of music. There's, there's a sense of um, belonging, camaraderie, um, you know, and if, when the music's on, can't beat it. It's in large part a part of the experience rather than the final product. Um, you know, obviously there are lots of bands out there, you know, Van Halen and, you know, um, uh, Taylor Swift, other bands that do the exact same show every night. They do it really well and it's like a theatrical thing. Um, whereas the jam band scene, which started with, with the Grateful Dead, um, was more about an explorative side of it. It draws a certain type of person, because you can go to see a show, and maybe you, you love a CD, and you love the songs, and, and I'm big into songwriting, and I love songs, but maybe I'll go to see a show, and, and they'll play the songs exactly off, like they are off the CD, which is cool, I'm, I'm good with that, but it doesn't necessarily draw me to want to see them again and again. But if you go to see a jam band, you might hear a song in a completely different way. You might not hear any songs off the CD that you've been listening to because they might be playing old songs or new songs. Or, so you never really know what you're going to get. The artists, they play a different show almost every night. So you're not seeing the same choreographed show. You're not seeing the same show. You're seeing a different show every night. Uh, and the fans are very loyal. They'll, they'll go to two in a row, three in a row, five in a row, 150 shows uh, in a row. You know, it's just a non-stop, non-stop party. You, know, you, you have a reality and then you can go on tour. And, you know, uh, whenever a, a jam band plays, it's almost like a mini vacation for a lot of people. Just as like, right, let's escape reality for a while. Now, in all honesty, a lot of us use drugs, uh, you know, LSD and, and mushrooms and um, psychedelic drugs as part of this experience. So part of what we were looking for was a different um, thing every night. My first impressions of the jam band scene, initially, um, the songs are so long. <laughs> it was like, how do you twirl for 20 minutes? It's, it, it literally was, was a, a culture shock for me initially changes your vibe when you walk into a building where they're listening to jam band music. It makes you want to spin around in a circle and have a hula hoop or something. I mean, it really, where's the tambourine? Um, because like you're ready to jump right in it. You know, you could put the whole umbrella of Grateful Dead, Fish, right down through Mo, Sea Pods, and then, you know, Glass Pony, from the very biggest bands to the smaller jam bands, and then the more happening ones now, like Twiddle, I think the one common thread is probably that they tend to improvise and they don't do the same show twice. So what happens is uh, the like-minded people go to see that, and then it becomes a community, and, and, and they make friends, and then it becomes uh, a whole thing bigger than just music, but music is still the, the lifeblood, it's still the heart that pumps the blood through the, through the scene. <laughs> what makes the jam band thing thrive and survive and be vibrant is musicality, first off. The fact that it's underground, always has been, always will be, it's not in the mainstream, so that always has a lure to the people that hate the mainstream, you know. Um, the fact that every jam band on every level has its you know, fans, they're my band. This is my band. So, you know, that keeps that scene alive. Thing is, they all cross genre those bands, you know, anyway, so if you're a Fish fan, you're still a Mo fan, you're still a Biscuits fan, you know, you're, you have all these. So it's like the, the uh, genre itself is the place where everybody gets thrown that they can't pigeonhole. Anything that is not exact pigeonholed to a certain genre becomes a jam band. So, you know, you could throw up a handful of rocks and two of them will hit a jam band <laughs> playing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, but you're, I mean, you're right, and that's, that's the thing, like, it, it exists primarily in, in this arena, um, and, and I think that's what it is, though, there's, there's something about that, 
I almost hate to use the word, but about that authenticity, like of the connection of people, like finding live music and it being, and for some people it's unique. They may have come from some other scene or seeing other kinds of concerts before and then they they, they, find, they discover this and they're like, oh shit, like those are real bands playing real songs and doing something unique in, in improvising and you know taking chances and all those things. But then once you discover the connections, the friendships, the, the, the stuff that goes deeper and you know, it's, you know, for some people it is just a party, but for a lot of people it's, it, it, goes, it goes a lot deeper than that. You know, the jam band scene, um, it, just, it just kind of evolved. At the time when the band started coming out, I was basically a hard rock heavy metal promoter. Um, and the same agents had some jam bands. And, you know, everybody knows the Grateful Dead, but, you know, nobody at the time, people didn't know Rusted Root or, you know, Mo. But the fans did. I didn't know about them at the time, but, and, you know, Greg was great. Greg, Greg is all over that shit. And, you know, him and I work with Phil Lesh together, with Mo together, uh, with Further together. So it's, yeah, we, been good. I like the jam bands. <laughs> Greg booking jam bands and you know being a big part of the jam band scene I guess was sort of a natural thing because he is a deadhead and therefore you know the kind of a lot of music he really liked and therefore and the people he came in contact with were part of that scene. I started booking shows I just happened to be at the right place at the right time when it was sort of like the third you know uh, wave of jam bands. You had the early, you know, the 60s, early jam bands, like The Dead, Jefferson Airplane, bands like that. And then you had the second wave was like Blues Traveler and Spin Doctors and Dave Matthews and things like that. And I got the next one where it was, you know, Mo and Disco Biscuits and stuff like that. I mean, basically, when I started working with jam bands, when they start out, they either sound like The Dead or they sound like Fish. And you know, people would say, oh, you know, that band sounds like Fish, or that band sounds like The Dead. And I said, they all do. They, oh, that's, they, they all came from Fish or The Dead, and they developed their own sound from there. And then when the disco business started, you know, Jamtronica, I mean, there are people who like the disco business, people who don't like the disco business, but you got to give them credit. I mean, they started a new genre of music. So then you start having, they either sound like The Dead, Fish, or a disco biscuit. Since then, now you know bluegrass is can you know part of the jam band scene. Jazz is part of you know, and it's it's sort of like the Dead were all American band playing all styles of music. Now all styles of music are all encompassed in the jam band scene. In terms of finding bands, I mean, most of the time they find you. You know, if if you got a good club or a good venue, and you know bands have played there, and they tell their friends, they're they're going to come and call you. You know, sometimes I just get that feeling. I can just, I look at a band, I see the way people are looking at them and how they're re reacting, and I just know that these guys are going someplace. Am I always right? No. Sometimes I see bands, there's hundreds of bands out there who are so talented that I have no idea why they're not famous, but they should be. It's just, you know, there's just so much, out, there's so much talent out there that there's only so much audience to go around, you know, but I, I can usually tell if somebody has something special. We realize that if we want to be a band, we need somebody who's going to help us book because we're really bad at it. Um, and um, me and Dave Woolworth, who was the bass player at the time, are trying to find somebody to do this. And I had found somebody um, who I thought was going to be pretty good at it. Um, she worked, um, she was just trying to get an agency off the ground and she was you know, going to be pretty good at it. And Dave had connected with Greg Bell somehow. I'm not, I'm not sure how. Dave played in a lot of um, bands in different configurations so uh, I assume one of those ran across Greg Bell and um, we're at Billy's New Town Tavern which is this shithole bar in Troy and uh, I can't remember who was playing that night but uh, we were talking and Greg walks up to Dave and I was like no nah, I don't like this guy you know I was like I don't know that Greg Bell he doesn't really you know it doesn't seem like you know any but Dave convinced me and it, it really didn't matter because Greg was helping you anyway okay once Greg saw that we were doing original music he didn't really give a fuck if we liked him or not my first memory of meeting Greg the ominous sea pods moved to Albany around 1990 and I don't think we met him the first year or two 
but it was very early. So we're loading in and, and usually the promoter or the owner that books the gig doesn't really get too involved with like setting up, but Greg was helping us load equipment up the stairs. There's a stairway at Valentine's. It was kind of always not fun. Uh, but Greg was Greg help, helping us out loading gear and I was sitting there like, wow, you're the first promoter that's ever actually helped us carry equipment before. The first time I had Mo on Wednesday nights for a while before Deadbeats started doing Wednesdays, we were doing tryout night at Valentine's. So the bands would play downstairs on Wednesday night and bands that we really liked, we would move upstairs as an opening act or a headliner, depending on you know what their draw was. And I think we had three people paid. Greg was the promoter of the show and also the only person at the show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it turned out that he loved it. He, he liked it. The owner was there and the bartender was there. The sound guy was there. I was working the door and we had three customers. And I was teaching at the time, you know, so I had to be up at like, you know, six o'clock in the morning to go teach at like eight o'clock. And most did their first set and you know, it's about 11.30 or 11 o'clock, 11.30. And I said, well, you know, if you want, you guys, you know, no one's coming out. It's a Wednesday, it's, it's already late. You know, I, I don't think we're gonna get anybody else out. If you want to head out, you know, I'll give you some extra gas money and some, you know, you can have a few beers. It wasn't the only time that we played to an empty room. And for us, it was, a, it was an opportunity to rehearse. <laughs> And we were going to play anyway because we were going to get paid. Free pizza. We were going to get our free, our free beer and our pizza or whatever it was that we were entitled to. And, um, and we were, I don't know, we were good for our word, if nothing else. So we were, we were committed to, to play the entire 90 minutes that we were contracted to do or whatever and put, put Greg through it. And they're like, well, now yeah, we're here. We might as well keep playing, keep practicing. And they played till about 2.30 in the morning. I'm saying, Jesus fucking Christ, I gotta get up in like three hours. Uh, let's finish it up. But there was just something about it, the energy, the fact that they didn't give a shit they were playing to three people. They were playing as if they were at a stadium. And that meant a lot to me. I mean, that the fact that they were there for the music. Back then, the Albany jam band scene was really vibrant. You know, there was the Sea Pods, Mo lived down the street for a time. They lived, I think, on Western Avenue. We lived in like Pine Hills area. We initially started playing, like opening for the ominous Sea Pods. I remember that. And, and then we would trade gigs. What we would do is we would contact bands that we heard of. They were living in Buffalo area, I believe, at the time. And they were, it started in Buffalo, so that was their hub. There was a place called Broadway Joe's, which was a, just a little hole in the wall where they would play all the time. And so we would call up bands, we'd say, hey, do you want to trade gigs? So that, that was a big thing back then. That was kind of a, a way that Albany became a, a popular spot on the circuit. And it was great. There was like this little renaissance of like bands that were all kind of- It was of a little jammy. Through. A little jammy. Because when we moved here from Buffalo, we were part of a music scene, but it had nothing to do with jam bands. Yeah. We were the only band that was sort of doing improvisational stuff. And there was no word jam band that didn't exist. Every Friday and Saturday, pretty much, Greg had something going on there. We played there. Greg really gave us a great opportunity to, to play there. And some of my most memorable shows you know, ever uh, were, were on that Valentine's stage. Like, Greg had this party, right? And he decides he's going to put Dr. Ja and C-Pods. And I, I think it was Conehead was the third band. And I think it's some anniversary or party, you know, like fourth anniversary of Guthrie Bell. I don't know, some, some holiday, made up holiday. Um, and he was going to give beer away. And this was, the, this was the shtick. It was 10 bucks to get in. And it was like as much beer as you could drink. Or there may have been some cap or whatever. And man, that was the first night that we got all three of those bands on stage. And the room was packed from like seven o'clock right until one o'clock in the morning and th that if you went to that night you were always going to see what was happening to valentine's because it was just mm -hmm. just a such a wonderful um uh you know musical experience and it was you know you felt like these were your local bands and man they were ready to go to the to the next level like this was this was some next level shit a lot of towns don't have clubs if you don't have a club to put a show there's no place to develop a scene and we were blessed here. You know, a lot of the bands in New York City, especially the all-age hardcore and punk rock, 
you know, because of the cost to operate a club in New York City, you know, they didn't have the small clubs that we had here. We had Valentine's, we had Bogies. I mean, it was exciting because there were just so many bands in Albany. There were so many venues. I mean, almost every bar had music, you know, so you could you could go out and see 10 shows in Albany. You know, we ended up, you know, hooking up with a lot of bands. Bands liked us because we were honest and, you know, we paid them, you know, we promised to pay them, you know, we treated them well. We were booking sometimes, you know, 15, 20 shows in a week. You know, one of the big, big acts that I got in at the time, who was not big at when I, was, I got him, was Jeff Buckley. I mean, who is now like sort of legendary and has a huge cult following. But when I got him, I had gone in the owner of Valentine's office to do something, and I saw all these press packs in the garbage. Because she would just get the press packs sent from like, you know, William Morris or whatever agencies were out there, and she would just throw them out. She wouldn't even open them up. So I opened this one up, and it's Jeff Buckley. And I knew Tim Buckley, his father. And I'm reading through it, and I listen to this stuff and I hired them automatically, and it turned out to be huge. I mean, we got tons of uh, respect from the indie rock people and you know, the, the non-jan band people because Jeff Buckley was so cool. So, I mean, there were nights there would be original bands downstairs, original bands upstairs, and, you know, both rooms would be packed. It was an alternative to Bogies. You know, Bogies was the, was the room at the time, and Valentine's was just another place to go, you know, so. What I tried to do is, you know, if Bogies was doing a jam band, I would do an alternative rock band. If Bogies was doing ska, I might do folk. I mean, we, Howard Glassman, who was booking Bogies at the time, and I would meet every Thursday to go over our calendars and stuff, trying not to compete against each other. There was much more of a community effort on the, between he and I. I was at Bogies till about 97. It was roughly about, about seven years or so, and the, and the new owners that came in uh, weren't about the music. They were not. They were about getting as many SUNY kids in, frat kids in for dance night, and the uh, live music suffered. The bands got the short shift of things, and I, I just couldn't be a part of that. And the manager of Valentine's at the time said, "Yeah, come on over. I'll give you a couple of bartending shifts, and you can maybe help me book some bands." So I did, went over there, and uh, probably within six months of being there, uh, she was like the owner of the business building, wants to sell it to us, meaning her and myself. And so yeah, we took over probably in 90, 99, I think we bought it, maybe 98. But it was really weird having Ted and Greg just choose completely different, you know, sets of music and, and, and way they out. You know, Teddy would come in with his, you know, he had all his crew, like he's right, and they'd march in, you know, you're at the door, get up in the green room, set the, you know, Greg would come in, you know, yeah, band's gonna load in a little while, uh, you know, get a case of beer in the back room, and where's Dominic, and how many mics do we have, you know, it was, it was but variety is the spice of life. I ended up in the clubs, and I ended up at, at the QE2, and Valentine's, and Bogies, and Saratoga Winners, and, uh, and I met Greg, at uh, Valentine's, um, when he was doing the Deadbeats downstairs, and I'd be doing shows upstairs. And at the end of the night, uh, you know, the Deadbeats would come on. It was midweek, if I remember correctly. It might have been a Wednesday night, and we do like Swedish metal upstairs, like with uh, you know the the beautiful Swedes with the full head of blonde hair. And, and the Swedes were mesmerized by the pretty hippie girls downstairs, and you know, and I, that's how I met Greg, you know, and uh, and I was a little mesmerized by it too, you know. But I had to go to work in the morning, and uh, when I first met Greg, and uh, you know, it was Wednesday night, no shows used to last until, I mean, if I remember correctly, it used to last till four o'clock in the morning. And I used to say to myself, "How the heck does Greg stay up to four o'clock in the morning and then go teach school?" The next morning, I was like, this is like a phenomenon to me. Because, you know, I'm an athlete. I have to be in bed at a certain time and get up. And I go to the gym. And I got a routine, you know. And I couldn't believe that Greg could stay up all night long. But uh, little did I know that Greg always had a little booster. You know what I mean? So uh, it was really an amazing feeling being a promoter and sensing the same kind of energy that I would get from the shows that I did, which were the antithesis of the shows that Greg did. And uh, you know there was never any competition because our genres are so were so different. But uh, you know knowing how hard the business is, and knowing how labor intensive it is, and know how many hours you put into it. 
Being a promoter is a hard part because you're you're putting a lot of money up hoping things are going to turn out well. You know, the clubs are always going to do fine. You know, the clubs always have money, they always have people in it, they always have people drinking. They're always going to make money, but as a promoter you just never know who how it's gonna turn out at the end of the night. And when you get there and you have to load in and you're starting at four and you're closing down at two and you gotta count the money and you gotta give you know people a thing, and you find out that you know you took in thousands less than you already promised to somebody that you're gonna pay them or that what the contract says, you know, that's that's the tough part of the business, you know. There are wins and there's are losses, but usually as a promoter there's it's it's not a it's not a safe bet. For me, the tough part of being a promoter was just to being, you know, not being home. And, you know, you have kids and you're working late nights and you get home at four and five and then your Sunday shot. And for me and Greg, you know, we were both working regular, you know, you know eight to five jobs in a, in a tough situation. So you just, you kind of have to sacrifice that little piece. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's worth it and you have, you know, I can think of other times where I book things and the, it's like a magical night, the band is wonderful, everybody's having such a great time and you're just happy that you're doing it. And I remember other nights where, you know, you're going to Valentine's and it's 7 o'clock and you're leaving your home and it's nice and warm and there's a huge snowstorm out there and you've got to go and you've got to cover for Greg because he, he can't go. So you're digging out your car and you're cursing your partner. Um, and you get there and you park your car and you get in there and it's a band from Boston. Yeah. Or one from Boston and there's just no one there. And it's like four people and it's sad. And the night ends and you, you, I, I, I couldn't, and I know Greg couldn't ever let somebody leave you know, that's on the road without paying them money regardless of you made it. So sometimes, it's like, you know, so it's out of your pocket. So you give your money out of your pocket, you go brush off your car, you go home. And we were in a tough neighborhood. You find out your stereo is going from your car from work in the night. And, you know, you lose money. You lose, you know, time from being away from your family. And, you know, at some point, you have to balance it out. It was fine. They were always friends. There was never a, any bad feelings that I Aware of. Like I said, they're great friends still. Now to this day, Jeff just got you got burnt out. You know, we weren't. You know, your weekends are gone. You know, you can't really plan and do anything. And he just decided, you know, he'd rather you know work on his education career. He was a he was an administrator at Parsons. He had a couple of kids. You know, he just decided that uh, he didn't want to do it anymore. And you know, it wasn't a big deal. I don't think you know we ever really sat down and. I mean, I think I still owe him money because I think I was supposed to buy the rights to his name at one point, but I never paid him. So, so he, he told me at one point he was going to wait until I, was, I got rich and then he was going to sue me. <laughs> Greg's building up at Guthrie Bell Productions into a thing, was it was a gradual thing. Like it was, you know, we had that first party and then he did a couple other things, an outdoor festival, and then things snowball. And it's it's not like all of a sudden, yes, this is our big production company that we're going to, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next 30 years. Um, it, it was just a slow progression of like, before you know it, more things are happening, more shows, they're doing more shows. At one point, Howard Glassman had left Bogies to go work at Valentine's and new owners had taken over and I was still doing shows there and it turned out that a woman who I was really good friends with and I worked with her band and I helped her out with a bunch of stuff and we actually did some stuff together. It appeared, it turns out that she was a nutcase. And she and Howard became partners of Valentine's and she was like bad mouthing us to each other. Like she was saying, oh, you should have heard what Howard was saying about you and you know what Dominic's saying about you. And I'd, I'd be pissed off and I'd say something. And I remember we got to the point where I went to a show one day that was not my show, and they weren't going to let me in. They said, well, you can't come in, you're not on the guest list. And I said, yeah, I am. And they said, well, whose guest list are you on? I said, every fucking band who has ever played here. So, but, it, but Howard wouldn't even serve me at the time. We had this big falling out. Howard and I were good friends, and we had this big falling out because this woman had drove this huge wedge between me and Howard and Dominic Campano from uh, Paint Chip Record. I mean, it was horrible. Not going to mention the name of my ex-partner, 
but she managed to uh, put a wedge in between just about everybody she came in contact with. You've heard this story before maybe? Yeah. So she put it between me and Dominic Campana, the, who I'd been friends with for you know a dozen years before that. Uh, and Greg, who I'd been friends with, she put it in his ear that, you know, I was going to get him out of Valentine's. And she told him that I was going to do something or other. So she said something to me. I can't remember exactly what it was, but Greg had said something. And I was furious. So I, I'm simmering, I'm simmering. And I'm not the type of person that, you know, I, I don't do a lot of confrontation. I just let it fizzle. One night it got to a heated exchange and I just started screaming at him because of what she had said. He didn't say. Long story short, he's like, I never said that. I'm like, yeah, man, fuck you. You know, we're going back and forth. And then turns out a couple months later, whatever, we all got our stories straight. We all apologized and we found out that all these things that had happened were not true. And she had just made this shit up, you know? So I wasn't doing shows at Valentine's for a while because they would not let me book shows. So I started doing shows at Savannah's and Lark. With Greg needing to find another place to book music in the Capital Region, a friend calls up with a revolutionary idea. A larger room with promise located across the Hudson River in downtown Troy. Its name, Revolution Hall. I got a call from a friend of mine saying, oh, you know, you should come over and check out this new place in Troy. He says, it's, I think he, he says, I think you do like three, four hundred people in this room. So I go over, it was it was like a soft opening and Dr. Ja was actually at the band playing, you know. There were not many people there, but it was just, you know, just to check the room out. And I went into the room, I'm thinking, 300 people, like, you can do like 800 people in this room. And they had no idea. Uh, a friend of mine was booking the room, and she said, oh, do you want to do some shows here? So the first show I did there was uh, the Disco Biscuit. At that point, the room was big, there was a lot of exits, the fire, fire marshal did not give us the capacity. We did not have a legal capacity. We had no idea how many people we could fit in. That night we found out that a thousand people was too much. And we had a thousand people show up for the Disco Biscuits. You could not move, the air conditioning was not working, it was hot. The windows wouldn't open. It was it was brutal, but it was huge. It was, it was amazing. You know, they sold so much beer, and we didn't really have any problems. And we had done with the show, and you know, I was like, "That's it. We're never doing these shows again." I said, "What are you crazy?" I said, "You just made you know, like ten, twelve thousand dollars here." You know. I first met Greg Bell at Revolution Hall. Um, it was this uh, bar in Troy. Um, I, I worked at. I was a um, a bartender, and. Um, he was the promoter on shows coming in, and he, and he just looked like this little old man coming in the, <laughs> the door that's hanging out with all these young kids. And it was like, you couldn't, I, at first I didn't, I couldn't figure out what was going on, but I worked there for seven years, so I got to see him a lot. And every time he would come, I would, I would make so much money at the bar. And it was like, oh my gosh, and he would just, sit at the end of the bar with his Budweiser and we would just give him free Budweiser all night long and he's just sitting there um, watching the um, people come in. Red Rip Hall was probably the venue that helped make my career. That's where I started doing way more national acts. And yeah, we still did local acts whenever we could, but that's when you know the word got out and all the agents were hitting us up for shows. And you know, we did Dark Star there, we did Keller Williams there, we did a Secret Mo show there. Uh, we had Go Go Berdello there. We, you know, we, we had some accent who became a huge playing there. Michael Ferrante. Our first show with Greg that was really exciting for us was uh, 2009 opening for U Melt. Mm -hmm. So U Melt used to come around. They were great because they had the two guitars. We had the two guitars. And it was uh, Andrew's first show in the band, first or second yeah. show in the band, right. was was the U-Melt show. Uh, 500 people there, Revolution Hall, great sound, and and Greg always being encouraging, uh, you know, knowing that we had a, a good crispy sound together, but also, um, you know, just encouraging us to do more and to, to do more writing and, you know, that kind of thing, and kind of seeing us go along. Sure, and that ended up turning into, you know, us open up for the New Deal at Rev Hall, sold out show, Really, really crazy experience. It was a great room. The unfortunate thing with Rev Hall is that the first owner, who was the owner of uh, Brown's Brewing, didn't really like the shows. You know, he sort of wanted a place that his regulars would go and hang out. 
he did not like the hippie crowd or the rock crowd so much. So he decided he wanted to sell the business. And we looked at buying the business, but one of the deals was in his contract that we could buy the business, but he had final say on who we booked. So we pulled out of the deal because we weren't going to do that. So someone else took it over and basically ran it into the ground because you know their, their aspirations were much higher than their talent for booking shows. And I don't think they realized how hard promoting shows and making money is. So they sort of went under. So like Gary stopped and we didn't have shows for a few months. Somebody else started up and he stopped. We didn't have shows. So every time a new owner took over, it was like starting all over again. It was like starting a brand new club. So I'd get to this point where we were starting to get good crowds and be dead. And we'd stop for five, three or four months. Get good crowds, stop for three or four months. So then another guy came in and uh, Jared Kingsley became the manager and he and I became very close and we got close to all the staff there. And that's where we did the, we probably did the most stuff. And we had shows going all the time. We had tons of huge shows. Everybody loved the music. They loved the audience. They loved the crowds. Everybody but Gary, he hated it. He still hated it. He, he wouldn't let people go out on the deck because they didn't want hippies out on the back deck bothering his customers. I'm like, Gary, you have 14 people in your bar. We have 800 people in this bar. These are your customers. But, you know, he didn't, he didn't get that. Gary took it back over and made it more of a you know, special events venue. Just a great sound and room, something that Troy needed. And I think they had it back in like the 80s or 70s or something. They had some cool spots, but there were really nothing like this in the 90s. And th until that came along and Greg was like the main promoter there. Revolution Hall, that, that scene was amazing. You, um, you can go there on a Tuesday or Wednesday night and the amount of uh, people uh, down the sidewalk You'd get the business owners mad because the line would be down the street and we're really um, trying to t explain to them that back then that it, it was going to help the whole area, which if you, if you go to that area right now, it really did. You know, when Greg was doing shows at Revolution Hall in downtown Troy, you know, now Troy, a lot of people are excited about it. There's lots of great new businesses, restaurants, bars going in, you know, it's, it's got a lot going on, but back you know, 15 or so years ago, it was definitely a little more quiet, not as much going on. And I think a lot of people don't really think about what live music can do for not just one singular place, but for a downtown. After spending years in the clubs and eventually bringing in national acts, Greg Bell made the step up to promoting concerts at the Palace Theater, one of Albany, New York's most iconic venues. Uh, I mean, the first show that I booked at the Palace, I think was 1998 and it was uh, Jimmy Cliff. I thought Jimmy Cliff, you know, he, he's a legend. He's a huge reggae legend. I'm thinking, oh, we're gonna be packed, you know, we're gonna have black, the black audience is gonna be here, the white audience is gonna be here, the hippies are gonna be here, the reggae people are gonna be here, we're gonna be packed, and we got the Conan Buddha people who are gonna come out. I guess I was wrong, you know, I think we had like maybe 900, 1,000 people come. But you know, my first show with Jimmy Cliff, we lost a bunch of money. My second show that I did here was probably about a year later, and that was with Medeski, Martin, Schofield, and Stubblefield, with Charlie Hunter opening up. And that was also another show that I misjudged how big the audience would be, and we took a, took a beating on that. And then I think the next show I did after that was Mo. That was around 98 or 99, somewhere around there too. And Mo basically sold out. That was one of the highlights of my career was having a full room with Mo here. But you know, coming into here, I had no idea what I was doing. Our yeah, second good. show at the Palace when Greg came up and was like, I think I finally broke even on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> sold out show. The second he doesn't sold care. out show at the Palace. And he was like, all right, we did it. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing when I started promoting shows. I just, I was throwing a party. You know, I had no idea about advertising or security or sound or lights. I, I had no clue. I was running blind, you know. I'm still running blind. I still don't know what I'm doing, you know. But luckily, I have a lot of people around me who do know what they're doing, and I try to work with them. I had a feeling Mo was going to be big, but I had, I had no idea I would still be doing this. I mean, I was just, I was a full-time special ed teacher. I was doing shows and going home at 3 in the morning and teaching at 8 o'clock in the morning for like 17 years. I was driven Greg home from like a show and it would be done by like 4 a.m. And, and he's, he's drunk and I'm like the sober driver because I was the bartender and I was serving him but I have to like take him home um, 
and, he, and it's 4.30 in the morning, but he has to be at school at eight o'clock. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I'm gonna, and he's like drunk talking shit to me. I'd call him the next day and be like, did you make it to work? And he's like, yeah, no problem. And, and he's like, snaps back in. He always seemed to be more fucked up than we were. And it was usually before the show. Yeah. Did he ever come And we were fucked up. I always thought it was amazing that Greg was able to do LSD and produce shows. <laughs> I, I said to myself, and I said to Greg, I wish I could cut loose like you just one night. Should we tell the story about the time he was at Putnam Den? And uh, had to go to the ER, oh, but yeah, stayed right. to settle out the show. <laughs> Three or four years ago, maybe, he had a show at Putnam, Den, Putnam Place. And I everyone orchestra and a lot of times these days I don't go to every single show Greg and if he's if he's going to Saratoga a lot of times he'll stay overnight up there rather than trying to come all the way back down at four o'clock in the morning or something but anyway so there's one night he was at a show I was home in bed and uh, I'm trying to think I believe it was around four o'clock in the morning and my phone rang and I'm like Greg it's like uh hi I just want to let you know I'm at the emergency room I'm going what what happened and he goes well I was having some problems at the show you know I waited till the show was over then I drove myself to the emergency room but I didn't want to worry you I'm like what he goes don't come don't come you don't have to come to the emergency room you'll just sit here for a while and I'm going oh for crying out loud so what what happened he had diverticulitis yeah, he had diverticulitis, like his right. frickin' intestine exploded. Right. Yeah. And he hung out and drank and... <laughs> settled the show. Settled the show. <laughs> settled the show. He was like bleeding at that point <laughs> and stayed anyway. You know, a lot of people have diverticulosis and every once in a while it flares up into this, an attack. In this particular instance, it had ruptured a blood vessel and he was bleeding profusely, but he decided I can make it to the end of the show, then I'll drive myself, bleeding profusely, to the emergency room in Albany. And don't tell my wife, because <laughs> I don't want to worry her. So yeah, I mean, he ended up being fine, but I'm like, oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> That's a typical Greg thing to do. I got up to the show and I'd been feeling sort of bloated for a couple days and I wasn't feeling that good. But yeah, the show was going really well. and. I, was, I started having some major medical issues with some internal bleeding and I'm looking at the show and it was probably like 11 o'clock and I'm thinking, well, I have a hotel room here in Saratoga that I have to cancel the room, I have to go check out, I have to go get to the hospital and I'm like, okay, well, I got about two more hours before I can shut the doors down. I have like probably about an $8,000 door going on here. I can't just walk away. Cut the door probably like around 12.30. I count out the money, I fill out the settlement sheets, I wrote out the checks, I gave it to Jared at uh, Putnam Place or whoever was there to pay the band. I said, apologize to the band, I gotta go to the hospital. I went over to the hotel, checked out, it was probably by that time it was probably about two o'clock in the morning. I was starting to feel weak because I lost a lot of blood. I was losing blood every time I went to the bathroom. So I get in the car and I'm like, well, I don't, you know, we only have one car, I can't have the car up here in Saratoga. And I didn't want Mar Mar Marilyn to worry, so I didn't even tell her I was going to the hospital. So I drove back to Albany. It was the middle, you know, it was cold. I had all the windows open. I'm slapping myself. Okay, five more miles, two more miles. I can get there. I get to the hospital. I walk into the emergency room. They take one look at me, and they take me into into the emergency room immediately. And I'm sit, I'm laying on the bed, and the, the nurses in there, they get me all hooked up to all the IVs and all that stuff. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I started feeling weird. I went and I grabbed the button to call the nurse. And the next thing I know, there's like 10 people in my room. Everybody's running around. It was like, it was like watching, you know, ER or something on, the, on TV. You know, all these people going, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're yelling and screaming and like rushing in and giving me a blood transfusion because I'd passed out from lack of blood. You know? But I got the show done. I got everybody paid and I'm still here to talk about it, so. The best thing in Greg's life is Marilyn. I don't know how she deals with it, how she puts up with him, um, but he's a lucky guy to have her, and uh, hopefully she'll keep him on the straight and narrow for at least a couple more years. Marilyn I love better than Greg, I have to say it. She's, uh, she's really a sweetheart. How is Marilyn 
put up with Greg Bell all these years because as great a guy as Greg Bell is, it's got to be a little exhausting having a husband that books a show, maybe he doesn't make any money, but puts hours of work into it and then is out till three in the morning. You know, my wife puts up with a lot of shit for me, but Greg, I mean, he put, he, I put on the shows, I could leave, because I had, you know, Greg put on a show, Greg stayed. Marilyn Bell is a very patient woman because she's a, she has dealt with, with Greg's idiosyncrasies for how long have they been married? I don't even know, but I imagine a long time. I used to be like, you're a saint, I can't believe you put up with him. Now I kind of sometimes am like, how does he put up with her? She's crazier, I mean, she's, she's wild, man. She, she gets after it, you know? I enjoyed going out and listening to music and having a couple of beers just as much as Greg did. And we had just a wonderful time. It was just so much fun. She's just the best. And you know, people think Greg parties, but Marilyn, I don't know how she does it, man. It'll be 1 a.m., 2 a.m., show's over, we're getting ready to go home. Marilyn's the one that says, oh, honey, come on, one more beer. Let's go to the other bar. I remember there was uh, one night where we are out till four in the morning with the bells and slept over at their house, and I wake up 8 a.m. feeling like shit, and Marilyn's there cooking us eggs, smile on her face, good morning, honey, and I'm just like, how are you okay right now? And she's, you know, she's had a lot of practice. The Bells, they know how to party. While Greg was promoting shows and building up a vibrant music scene in Albany, he also created Bellstock, an annual music festival hosted on his family's land in East Jewett, New York. You know, Bellstock started sort of by accident, like almost everything in my career, in music career. Bellstock started because at one point, my family's house in the Catskills, we were starting to build a deck onto the back of the house. It was the anniversary, it was 1994, it was the anniversary of Woodstock. And I said, oh, why don't we just, you know, I had already been booking shows for a couple of years. So, yeah, you know, why don't we have a few bands here, we'll just do overnight. So we called it Bellstock, it's a joke, you know, for Bellstock. And I think the first, the picture was, instead of like a dove, we have a dodo bird, you know, with a guitar, you know. And uh, it was just, it was just a, it was a joke. It was done for a joke and for having some fun. And I think, you know, we had maybe, it was one night. I think we had maybe 10, 12 local bands, or pretty much all local bands playing. And it was a fun time. And then we decided next year we'd do it. And next year, Mo was starting to take off and the sea pods were hot and Kona Boo was hot. And I had, some, I had some bigger name bands. That was the year the town decided they were gonna pass a mass gathering law. And I didn't know about the mass gathering law, so the mass gathering law started the day before Bellstock of that year. I said, well, you know, I'm having it anyway. So every night the cops would come and shut us down. And I can remember like on Friday night, it was, uh, it was Conan Buddha, Ominous Sea Pods, and Mo, Mo headlining. And Mo was maybe a third way through their set. And the state troopers came back for like the third time that night. And they said, Greg, if we come back again, you're coming with us. So I went up to Al and Mo, and I said, hey, Al, you gotta stop, you know, do a couple more songs, you gotta stop playing, because you know, they're gonna arrest me if you keep playing. So Al gets on the microphone and says, could everybody wave goodbye to Greg, because he's gonna be leaving here soon, and they just kept playing. <laughs> just a great, like, great party, you know, four or 500 people, like, on a, on a property for a weekend, you know, like. And he even took a chance on, like, the lawn sausages at 7.30 in the morning. Um, at Bellstock down in West Jew. I mean, by the time we got there, because it was a hell of a ride for us, we didn't know where we were going, no GPS in those days. By the time we got there, we were already baked, baked and blasted out of our mind. We were hammered. And 7.30 in the morning, here's a bunch of guys wearing dresses and singing about spanking the babysitter on the stage here. Everybody just went to bed. So we're trying to get people up and alive, and Greg's laughing his ass off because he knew the joke of it, you know, sausages for breakfast ran through the fire pit and set the fringe on my Tanya Harding outfit on fire. So now here I'm smoking and burning all over the place and running through and pulling all the tent wires up and dropping people's tents on them. They came out, they had a great time, it was a great thing, you know. But this was the kind of innovation that, you know, Greg brought, Greg and Jeff too early on, brought to the area. They, um, they took a chance and did things. By the third one we were up to like 36 bands over the, th uh, over the three days. And that year we had rain that started at midnight on Friday, torrential rain, and didn't stop until 10 o'clock the next night. So it was like 22 hours of torrential rain. 
Every band that showed up could not play because at that point, you know, the roof was leaking over the stage. Everybody's saying, well, it can't rain forever. Can't rain forever. And after like 10, 15 hours, like shit, it's gonna fucking rain forever, you know? So that night we, uh, there was a ranch next to my family's property and they had a band living there who had a studio and they came over and I said, hey, you know, why don't you bring your, some bands over to the studio? So we drove over to the studio, we did Bellstock in a barn for that night. And then the next Sunday, everything cleared up and we still kept it going. But there were basically three main rules, none of which were popular, but well, two of which were popular. Okay, one rule was no bare feet. Now, the people, they went, of all the rules you could have, that was the one they were most upset about, was no bare feet. I'm like, look, it's an old farm field, you know, there's stuff buried underground, it comes up, you know, you, I don't want people getting hurt, you know, we just, we're trying to keep it safe. The other rule was no drum circles. And the rule was see a drum, beat a drum. And that rule came about because one night, there were some psychedelic drugs going around the festival, and at about two in the morning, they started doing a sublime song, just, just the chorus of the sublime song, love is, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they just kept doing it over and over on beating drums. There's like, there's 40 white kids on acid out there beating drums, none of them could keep a fucking beat. They're just making noise and singing the same song over and over and over again. I was pregnant for Annie, and I remember at like 4.30 in the morning uh, waddling out of the house because they were still like, the drums were set up on the platform right at the back of the house, and then one of them was just still like, dum, 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 dum. My wife wakes me up, she says, go shut them up. So I go outside, I'm screaming, and they couldn't even hear me, they were so loud. I'm like, shut the fuck up. You know, what are you talking about? I said, no more drums. And they said, oh, okay, come on, Greg. I said, no, if you beat that drum, I'm gonna throw it in the fire. And I said, oh, you're not. I said, God, beat that motherfucker. I'm going to throw it right in the fire. So from then on, no drum circles allowed. No drums at Bellstock. See a drum, burn a drum. And the other rule was no assholes unless they're friends of mine. In recent years, Greg took another venture with Eastbound Jesus, and at the time, rising Americana Act from rural Washington County. From managing the band to helping book shows, they eventually created an exciting new music festival, Eastbound Throwdown. I'm so happy that Greg found Eastbound Jesus and just provided them with so many great opportunities to play in front of big crowds, you know, whether it's opening for bigger bands at big venues or just slowly developing them as one of the really premier, most popular acts in our region. This young girl that I knew who used to do flyering for me kept telling me I had to go see her friend's band. I'm like, oh, who are you? She says, well, they're called Eastbound Jesus or something. I'm not going to go see some Christian band. You know? And she kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. So finally I said, okay, I'll go. So I went down to Red square when they're playing and it was, it was early in your career and there's maybe 60 people there which is not bad for back back room of red square and the first thing I noticed every single person in the room was singing along to every song they played and grinning from ear to ear and I think oh, this is interesting so I went and saw them a couple more times and I really liked their stuff and I just sort of sort of pushing myself in with them, you know? I think they were a little hesitant to get involved with this old man who they didn't know anything about, you know? I just kept get, getting them more gigs and higher profile gigs and opening acts and stuff. When we first got into it, we had no scene in mind. So we weren't looking, for, when we first got into the music scene, we weren't looking for any scene to be a part of. I don't think we knew what was out there at all. Yeah. I didn't know anything about the local music scene outside of Greenwich. At all, I have no idea. I had no idea what was going on in Albany. We slowly found our way into the jam band and rock scene, you know, just over time, naturally. Well, thanks to Greg, we started playing a ton of local music festivals, like all around the Northeast. We were getting, you know, we we're spending half our summer playing yeah. festivals, and there was some really great ones and some really fucking terrible ones. Horrible. Took a lot of notes. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, like directions. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, yeah we are just like, mm, we could do this better. The Eastbound Throwdown, I just can't say enough good things about it. It is seriously my favorite weekend of every year. <laughs> Greg told us we were nuts. Greg's like, no. Yeah, you know, at first I thought, oh, you guys are nuts. I mean, you know, we're not gonna be able to draw enough people to pull you know, the expenses for, and yeah, they're like, we, we want to do it, Greg. We really want to do it. And I'm like, well, you know, I am your manager. Okay, I'll, I'll go along with it. Greg also knew that we could do it better too. I mean, yeah. he's run his own festival. 
and he's been to enough festivals. He know he knew all the same signs of what was good and what was bad and what festivals need and what they can do without. You know, you need someone like that. Yeah, Greg's always had our back because yeah. even when he was like, I don't know, guys, we're gonna jump into a two-day festival. You know, he's like running numbers, and he gave me the twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar number. I was like, whoa! I thought I was thinking more like ten thousand. He was like, nope, this is what's gonna cost. He's like, but we'll do it, you know, 50-50, you know, and he was like, oh, whatever, if you guys want to do it, I'll do it. For something like Bellstock, I pretty much do everything. I have to set everything up, but with Throwdown, it's a little bigger, it's a little bit more intensified, and, you know, the guys in the band do a lot of the work, you know, they take a lot of the pressure. I mean, I basically take care of finances and, you know, some logistics here and there, but most of the work is done by those guys, so that makes it easier for me. Yeah, I think it's cool that we've become sort of like a smaller festival, but like a, a go-to Americana festival in the Northeast where there's people from all over the place coming in because, you know, we're doing a good job at how we curate the music, how we set it up, the vibe and everything. So it's been fun to sort of start, start small and sort of how we've gotten to it. And, you know, even just how many bands are now submitting to come to our festival. And, you know, there's a lot of buzz around it, and it's fun to sort of see it turn into like this very unique and not big, but popular music festival in the, you know, throughout the Northeast. We sold out the last couple years. Like, it's one of those events. You go once, you fall in love. I mean, the music, just Eastbound Jesus plays both days, and then they kind of handpick bands that are friends, bands that they've played with, and then newer bands that submit to them. And if they just fit the vibe, we bring them on, and. I absolutely love it. I had no idea about the Throwdown or Greg Bell or anything like that. And actually, my first gig with them was at the Throwdown. And I was like, okay, a weekend of camping and, and jamming and things like that. And I'm like, okay, there's a bunch of hippies, you know, this and that. Great, I love that. And I showed up and I was like totally blown away by like how professional it was and how big it was and everything like that. So, and their fans were just like so welcoming and so into it. And I was like, I think I hit the jackpot with these guys. So, better not screw it up, you know? The Throwdown's such a community driven event and Greg surrounds himself with like so many great people that all chip in and <clears throat> help us put on a really good show and yeah Greg has there's a lot of people that wouldn't be involved if, if Greg wasn't yeah. involved. He has as you much know? of a built in crowd as we do. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, there's a crowd there that's there just for Greg. <laughs> Every music scene ebbs and flows through the decades. Generations of fans and styles of music. Albany is no different. Venues close, new ones open, bands dissolve and new ones form. It is a stopping point for bands on the road in between bigger markets and a great place to get a band up and running. While the names and places may change, there is no shortage of spaces to enjoy music and no shortage of people to fill them. Uh, Albany actually is pretty vibrant. Um, it, it, there seems to be a pretty good music scene here. Definitely stronger than Syracuse where I live, but yeah, Albany is very vibrant and, and it always has been. It's got like a kind of a New York City, a miniature New York City feel to it. For the 15 years that I've been here, it seems as though it's been a very consistent stream of, of bands routing through this area. I mean, it completely makes sense when you consider the fact that three major markets are, are a triangle around the capital region. So they're going to maybe want to uh, get the cobwebs off by starting their tour here or take a Tuesday, Wednesday night and stop in, in the Albany area for a show. So I, I definitely know that that benefits us. Pretty much every major touring act on that arena level and then the theater level comes to Albany. So then that creates a whole secondary club scene that happens where, you know, if you're, you, you, you've been to Fish or you've been to Trey or Mo Show or whatever, every music venue in downtown, as far as you can get, is doing shows after. There's potential for a good show, I'd say, all around the capital region, Absolutely, you know, yeah. really anytime and there are people that want to go out. Like you said, they will travel an hour plus to go see your band. It's more vibrant with the number of bands than it ever has been. Finding a local music show in the past was almost impossible. Now everyone's vying to do local stuff. That's very cool. You see, it's even a meme, I think, at this point. Without the local scene, there's no national scene. Without the national scene, there's no rock stars. It's, it's like all your favorite bands were even if it was only for a week, they were all local bands at one point in time. 
Um, and as a, as, a touring, as a touring band, as, as a band that's like out there hitting the road and playing the clubs and stuff, without those guys willing to believe in you and willing to like bring you in, uh, you don't have a chance in hell. You, you, you need those guys, you need those guys. Even if they are, you know, like grouchy as fuck, like Greg Bell. You know? And he is grouchy, make no mistake, he's grouchy. There is no denying the fact that when you have a promoter like Greg Bell who is going to be super fair with you, super honest with you, and continue to support you, whether it means that he's putting money in his pockets or taking money out of his pockets, that's, that's something that I don't care how dirty the music business might be from time to time, but that's something that, that bands and agents are going to respect and want to come back to time and time again. People know when he attaches his name to it, like it's going to be one of the better parties that this scene has to offer. A community like the Albany jam band scene is hard to find. A promoter like Greg Bell, even harder to find. He has helped create a community where discovering new music is celebrated and the person standing next to you may become a lifelong friend. Don't tell me this town ain't got no heart. You've just got to go to more Guthrie Bell shows. What I recognize about the music scene here, and it was quite intimidating when I first moved here, was how everybody knew everybody. And everybody seemed to end up with one central figure being the, the center of the nucleus, and that being Greg Bell. Greg Bell is just somebody that knows how to throw a great party. And that's really what he does. It, as far as, uh, you know, as a promoter, that's really what his job is, just throw a great party. And when you see his name attached to it, you know you're gonna have a good time and it's gonna be quality music. Yeah, isn't that, it's such a community uh, that, that has been created in this area where it, maybe you don't know everyone's name, but you definitely know that face and you've seen them before. And, and I'm, I'm, I can only imagine how proud Greg must be of, of knowing that that's because of him. And he is the most recognizable face in that crowd all the time. He wanted to create a collection of, of safe spaces um, where people that uh, were interested in the arts and, and thinking and, and all the things that we were interested in could go to uh, on a regular basis, have a great communal experience, um, and then go home and maybe live their lives a little bit differently. I don't, I don't know if he would characterize it that way, but as I think about it, I think that that, there, that played a lot of it. Uh, into um, into why he gave all his time and effort to that. You see these same people show in, show out, and then, you know, at some point you might be standing next to them and during between songs you start talking to them, you start talking to them like after the show, at the merchandise table, you know, you become friendly with them. I, I have a bunch of friends that I've met at shows like Greg Bell's Throne. I had some shows where you know, you know 90% of people coming through the door and you know, they know you, you know them, everyone knows that they're in for a great night of music, whether they've seen the band a hundred times or it's a new band that Greg's bringing to town because he believes in them, he thinks the music is good. And you know, there's that trust there, I think, with a lot of people that go out to see shows. If Greg's booking it and Greg's likes it, it's, uh, it's probably pretty good. There's a lot of people who come to my shows who are friends. I've been invited to their weddings, I've been to their houses for dinner, they come to my house. I mean, I think one of the things I like most about this business is the people that I get to meet. I mean, some of my closest friends are in bands that I've booked for years or people who come to my shows. And you go through like generations of people, you know? I mean, the people who, I, who started coming to my shows when I started were 20 years old, in their 20s then, now they're 50. I mean, it's bizarre. So you get people coming from like 20, to maybe early 30s, then they settle down and have kids, and you don't see them for 20 years, then all of a sudden you start seeing them again. It's true, like we've had a lot of people say, oh, I met my girlfriend at one of your shows, or like I met all my friends, that, and we've had people that um, have moved to this area from other places tell them, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't happen upon one of your shows, now I've met all these people. It makes Greg very happy to hear those kind of things. I mean, that's really, what it's all about. Like, I don't know why Greg would describe he does what he does. Purely, I mean, clearly it's not for the money. Greg, I don't think he was ever like, I want to get rich doing this or anything like that. I think he truly believes in the scene. It's about the personal touch. It's about actually caring. I know how many shows he's lost money on, you know, and, but does he, he dust himself off, get back up, do it again. You know, that's how it is. It's like, yeah, I love this band. I'm gonna take a bath, but I love this band and I can say I booked them. That's cool. You know, you don't get that with the corporate world. He's usually right. 
I mean, he knows his music. He knows what's good. He knows what he likes. And what he likes usually ends up being what a lot of other people like. Biggest thing that you can say about Greg is, in, in terms of this industry, and you can ask anybody, I mean, a lot of promoters just aren't honest, and a lot of club owners just aren't honest. And he is, without a doubt, the most honest person. And I think that's why he's really, you know, loved by musicians who just know that, you know, he's not going to cheat him out of money. He's, he's going to help him the best he can. He's going to give him the best deal he can. I would, I would never do a show in Albany without Greg, and he'll tell you, I call, even if someone offers me a gig, I call Greg, and I'm like, hey man, I'm getting this offer, like, I w don't want to do it if you're not involved, or I won't do it if you're not involved, if you say you don't want me to do it, any of that kind of stuff, that's my relationship with Greg, I'm just like, hey man, like, this is happening. You know, he's a good businessman, you can tell, he's been doing this a long time, he knows his shit, but there's a level of personal connection and like you can tell that he's personally invested in a way that a lot of other promoters are not and for a lot of guys it's strictly business it's strictly numbers it's it's all about you know you try to settle up at the end of the night and you get your numbers and you go when I settle up with Greg at the end of a gig after doing this for so long he never fa fails to tell me like how much he loves our band and how much he believes in our band and how like happy he is to just know us and hang out with us and, and you don't get that anywhere else man there's, there's a lot of guys that aren't as personally invested I guess um, and that goes a long way I think that's something that you know the industry could use more of these days he does things the right way for the band every time which a lot of promoters don't do he uh Oftentimes, you know, if, if a band doesn't make what he wants them to make, he whatever profit he could have made or whatever, you know, he'll lose a little bit more to, to, to round the number up so, so they make more money. His settlement sheet, some people that are watching don't know what settlement sheets are. His settlement sheet is the most basic settlement sheet in the whole world, but all the numbers on it are real. And I think that uh, that's, I don't think that's very common in the business. I just always know if Greg hits us up, it's a show worth playing. Anybody else? If somebody hits us up to play a show, I gotta kinda interrogate them to make sure that it's worth it for us and decide whether we're gonna play it or not. If Greg reaches out, we're playing that show. We're gonna make it a priority. He's got quite the personality and you know, he's just like, you know, he knows what he wants and he knows how to get it and, um, and he's not afraid to tell you what he liked and disliked about your set. And uh, one of my favorite memories of um, uh, a show here uh, under Greg was um, we played in Space Carnival, we covered Toto's Africa, and uh, the room loved it. We had a packed house, they thought it was great, it was a very popular song at the time. And uh, we get off stage, and Greg comes over and he gets to me and he has, says, Hey man, great show, don't ever play Africa on my stage ever again. And that to me just kind of sums up Greg Bell in a nutshell. A lot of promoters book the show and they don't, e they don't even go, you know, they don't really care that much. And not that Greg goes to every single show that he books, because no one can do that and still be alive, But because uh, he books a lot of shows. But he goes to most of the shows, I would say, and the good fortune of me stays for the entire thing. Greg has brought so many bands that were up and coming like into the limelight, and I think it's really beautiful to watch the way that he um, not only, like, moves musicians forward and kind of propels them into the trajectory that they like were always supposed to take but he just like gives them a little bit more of a nudge by putting them on stage and promoting them and, and bringing this awareness to all these groups of people that might not otherwise be aware. And that's the thing too, he gets these like big acts, right? And he also is really supportive in getting smaller local bands trying to make it. He's yeah. like, he's always like made it a point to help those bands out, you know? And that's and that's cool. That's what's cool about him too is he he keeps an eye on the small bands that are coming up and constant, you know, like and he gives them chances and puts them on with with other bands and and yeah, builds this community. Like if you're going to see a band play at a Greg show, you're not going to skip the opener because you know. Greg's gonna bring someone good who, you know, a local band Might that you should know. The yeah, first time we got asked, like Greg asked us to do a show, we were like kids in a candy shop. Being where we were at that time, and we were just getting started, you know, we've been playing a little bit, we felt like we made it, you know, and all of it, yeah. like, you know, yeah. but we were like, this is it, you know, we're, we're yeah. big time, yeah. we're on a Greg Bell show, you <laughs> Greg know. Greg is the jam scene in Albany. Really, you know? he is, like, yeah. 
he's like a household name in the music scene. If you're, if you're talking to a musician in Albany and they don't know who Greg Bell is, then they're not doing it right. If you want to get in on playing anywhere and have people come to your shows, you got to be a Greg Bell show, you know? Look at Disco Biscuits, Mo, you know, all the bands that he has you know, brought to life. He takes care of a lot of other things to allow the musicians he's working with to be in that space. Like he gets that, like, you know, hey, I got it. You go play, I'll go deal with this, right? I think Greg is gonna be the Albany music scene uh, immensely by giving us a, a, a very solid foundation and layer of bands that we may not be seeing from other promoters. Greg is constantly bringing in new acts and, uh, and, and even older ones, but it's there. It's not just because you know this is this is what's hip right now. He'll he'll go out on a, on a limb and say, you know what? Let's let's give this a shot. Let's 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 give this act a shot. And and for that, I mean, that's why the Hollow has been become now the destination point for for good original music. One thing I'd say that Albany did have was a guy like Greg Bell, who knew how to put shows together, knew how to match the right opener with a headliner. We had his, uh, his street team out handing out flyers. That is one thing that kind of makes it a little different because a lot of cities didn't have that. They just had a bar with a club owner who would book shows. Maybe if you were lucky, you'd throw a poster up in the, in the door and in the bathroom over the uh, urinal of the men's room. And, uh, and that was about it. So what separated Greg Bell was he stayed with it for years and years. Whether he was making money or not, he kept doing it because he loved the music. So, you had originally asked me what, how scenes varied. So I would say that's the biggest difference. Is a guy like Greg Bell. Not every city had that, and that really did make the uh, whole Albany music scene, particularly the jam band scene, flourish. So uh, I am. Uh, this is in the 2010 type range, and Greg has been promoting bands for. For a while and it's given us an opportunity to play with, with with many of them man he really gave us some connections with some wonderful bands so i'm there at bonnaroo there i am and um i can see five stages from the spot that i'm at and on all five of those stages are bands that opened up for us through greg bell uh earlier in our career there's like guster and mo and soul live um, and I forget who the other the other two were, but you know, and I was just looking around, going like, "Wow, this is a pretty cool thing that um, that being part of the the business side of of Albany's art scene allowed us to allowed us to do." I look back and I don't, I have no idea how I was doing. I mean, I was you got to understand when I started out, there was no internet, there was no emails. I was taking my prep periods, and I had a phone card. I'd go into the office on a pay phone and call agents for my 45 minute prep period and book shows that way, you know? Greg Bell's legacy to this area will be felt for generations and generations to come. He set this place on the map. Uh, it, is, it is part of the scene, whether he's here or not. And I know he's going to be here for a good long time because I've shown up to concerts uh, and, and hung out and partied with Greg Bell only to have him casually mention later that evening, oh yeah, I had heart surgery earlier today. <laughs> that guy, he's the cockroach of, of the rock and roll scene in this area. He lived through a nuclear holocaust. His legacy on music is profound and I'm really glad to be one of his asshole friends. Greg Bell, I love you. May you live forever and ever and ever. You're the, you know, you're the reason I've, without Greg I probably wouldn't even still be in this business. I just keep hoping that I'm going to meet another promoter as cool as him um, and it's just never going to happen. He's been a great friend. He's been a, you know, great promoter. Great help to my band. Come back, dude, he's a fucking legend. I want to thank Greg Bell for giving me the opportunity to be employed, to inspire me to always fight through the difficult times and to have fun while doing it. And uh, this one's for you, Greg Bell. In my opinion, Greg Bell is the Albany music scene. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's sort of like a gambling addiction. I know a few friends who had gambling addictions who, you know, Every time you saw them, all they talked about was the money they were making. They weren't talking about the hundred bets they made that they just lost, you know? And you know, with me, it's like, 
I quit this job four or five times a week. I'm like, I'm done, I'm sick of this shit, I don't wanna do this anymore, I can't keep losing money, I can't do this. And then you get the phone call or you get the email and all of a sudden the adrenaline starts kicking in again and all of a sudden you're back at it again. The very fact that Greg is still doing this after 30 years has made me pretty proud. You know, it's like that alone, that fact alone is an amazing thing and that he's so well-respected and well-liked by everybody he works with, for the most part. I'm sure there will be somebody who disagrees, but generally speaking, he's very well-liked and very respected by all the bands he works with. Most of them have become really good friends of his, and the audiences love him and have a great time at his shows. That makes me pretty proud.
singing. 